there we go so um over to you philip kick off as and when you're ready and then we can take it from there welcome to today's webinar which is all about request to pay and what it means for vulnerable customers my name is philip king i'm in my 44th year of working in credit management and related fields of which 14 were spent as chief executive of the Chartered Institute of Credit Management. More recently, I was appointed by UK government as the interim small business commissioner for 18 months. I'm passionate about all things credit management and small business, and I'm fortunate to spend my time now working with some organizations who lead that passion and feed it for me. One of these is Blue Chain, which offers an innovative solution to make the process of billing painless and uncomplicated. Today, I'm joined by an illustrious panel, Tina Harrison from Edinburgh University, Carl Packman from Fair by Design, Mike Chambers from Answer Pay, and Tim Annis from Blue Chain. I'm going to invite each of our panelists to introduce themselves shortly. But before I do, just a couple of things to set us on our way. We keep saying recently we're in unprecedented times. Um, we've said it through COVID, we've said it through various things, but we are indeed in difficult times of turmoil with businesses facing an ever increasing array of problems and challenges. Running a business is always tough and having battled their way through the pandemic, businesses are now facing a multitude of issues. Shortage of supplies, I'm sure you like me, have seen some of the empty spaces on supermarket shelves as supplies are difficult to find. The impact of the war in Ukraine on the supply chain and questions about who businesses are trading with and where they're sourcing their supplies from. Increasing costs, raw materials, supplier prices, freight charges, fuel, demands for higher wages and energy costs. An interest rate that's just hit 3%, the highest level for 15 years, and uh, a steer from the Bank, of Econ the Bank of England chief economist telling us that they're likely to stay high or even go higher. Inflation at more than 10%. Cost of living increasing at the highest rate for 40 years. Grocery price inflation hitting 14.7% in October. Demand is likely to be impacted by the loss of spending appetite and the loss of discretionary spend that's available. We're gonna see borrowing costs increase. Surging rates of insolvency are going to mean that businesses find it harder to find funds as the appetite to lend is reduced by the risk that's represented. And no business or consumer is immune. We're not islands and relationships in business and between business and consumers are intertwined. So this is a timely session. Let's explore what request to pay means for vulnerable customers. But first, as I said, I've introduced myself. So here, here, let's hear a little bit more about our panelists. Tina, can you give us a brief thumbnail of your background, please? Hello, um, I'm Tina Harrison. I'm a professor of financial services, marketing and consumption at the University of Edinburgh. So I'm an academic and I do research. Uh, I'm interested in anything to do with financial well-being and financial vulnerability, financial vulnerability and what we can do to help support people um, in managing their finances and, and payments and pay, you know, paying their bills is, is one cru crucial part of that, and particularly now. Indeed it is, Tina, so thank you very much. Carl. Hello, I'm Carl Peckman, I'm the Head of Corporate Engagement at Fair by Design. And Fair by Design was set up to design out the poverty premium, which is the extra costs that low income households pay on their essential bills. And um, the poverty premium is something that, while it doesn't get the same airtime as the cost of living crisis, is definitely something that has been exacerbated by it. So a very big subject for today. Thank you. And Mike. Hi, uh, hello everybody, and Philip, thank you for mo for moderating today. My name is Mike Chambers. Uh, I used to run the UK systemically important uh, payment systems as CEO. So it was my responsibility to grow direct debit to four and a half billion transactions a year. 
to achieve reach and ubiquity of faster payments and the rollout operation of current account switching. So some real crucial uh, things in the payments history over the last decade. Now, that's what I used to do. I'm now the chairman of Answer Pay Company, uh, the request to pay company Answer Pay. I'm a payments advisor and I publish the Payments Unpack newsletter. Brilliant. Thanks, Carl, uh, Mike. And many of us will read your Payments Unpack newsletter every week when it comes into our inboxes. So thank you for doing that. It's a useful source. Tim. Thanks. Hello. Yes. So my name is Tim Annis. I'm MD for Blue Chain, who's also a request to pay company uh, in the UK. So uh, my background has been in payments for the last nearly 20 years, which is a horrifying number, to be honest. But um, uh, and I, I'm a big believer in how technology and payments can really help to help everybody who's involved in it, whether that's a consumer, whether that's a business. There's a huge amount of scope to, to add value into that. Um, very much along the lines of what um, Carl talks to around fair by design. I think it's really important. Thank you, Tim. So welcome to all of you and to everyone who's watching this webcast. First of all, Patina, as, professional, as a professor of financial services, marketing and consumption, uh, as, as an academic, you already look at trends and changes in behaviour. What are you seeing in the provision of services by payment providers currently? Well, one of the big things, I think, is is buy now pay later and other things like that that are allowing consumers the opportunity to spread their payments out and uh, and these services have really um, mushroomed uh, over the last few years um, data that um, my colleagues and i have been analyzing open banking data looking at banking transactions is showing that this has increased by at least 54 percent amongst some some consumers uh, and i think in the uk at large we've got something like a third of of people in the UK have have had some experience of using buy now pay later and there's increasing evidence now to show that a good third of those that are using it are now starting to experience um, unmanageable debts um, as a result of using it. Okay, thank you. Um, and is there anything in those trends that from your research we need to be doing that we're not? So one of the problems is because it's it's not regulated in the same way as other consumer credit is regulated. It's it's not checked. It doesn't have the same kind of monitoring to it, and that's one of the one of the problems that it's freely available. It's easy to get into, and it's easy to build up unmanageable debts. And then that becomes a real problem for consumers and for many consumers who are already in a vulnerable situation because they turn to buy now pay later because it's interest free up to a point until you run into difficulties and then um, uh, ma uh, rack up um, too many payments that they can lose sight of. On average, you know, people are, are managing around four or five purchases on buy now pay later, you know, when you consider that they're then cut down into three or four payments, that's a lot of individual payments to keep track of um, compared with, say, one structured payment uh, uh, from a loan, for example, or something that's got more oversight from it. Yeah, I think that's right. And, and I think you know, we've all read the horror stories in the you know the weekend press about people that have been sort of sucked in. But, it, you know, it's so easy to hit the button when you're buying. Shall I pay now or shall I pay over four installments? And you do that repeatedly and suddenly you're into a situation you haven't foreseen. Thanks so much for sharing that. Carl from Fair by Design, given the need we've seen from both consumers and businesses for a better way of doing things, given the current market situation, what should we be thinking about currently? I think um, one of the things that we should think about is, is the, the external environment that, that, that lots of people are, are sort of currently situated within. Uh, it's one thing to look at someone's finances and say that's a vulnerable person, which I think is what lots of businesses and, and policymakers and governments have done previously. They, they've taken a person and they've said, well, that's a financially vulnerable person because they have X number of characteristics. But what the, the question we're not asking is, um, what are people vulnerable to? And obviously you've got this horrible situation of a cost of living crisis. You've got this horrible existing situation of people existing, uh, of people paying a policy, you know, their credit bills, insurance bills, even if they're able to get those sorts of things. Um, lots of these things uh, stack up 
you know, you got to also a situation where people are in, in, in what's called flexible work, but often means not enough hours. Uh, the environment and the current situation for a lot of people today is, is very, very precarious. And this means that suppliers and payments providers have to be very, very careful and very, very smart about how to provide a service for those, for those people and ask, the, ask themselves the questions, what are, the, what are groups like low income, uh, you know, uh, precarious uh, income workers, what are they vulnerable to, not what's their vulnerability? That's the question that should be asked. Okay, thanks for that. It's interesting, isn't it? Um, I think that we've, we, we've seen over recent weeks lots of noise about the cost of living. Um, and and when, you, when you look at interest rates and mortgage rates and all of those things that are combining, um, and, and for people that are on you know, flexible hours and, and, and so on, it, it's a real challenge. And um, I personally worry about you know, the mental health of many of these people too, because you know, they are so vulnerable. But thanks. Let's hear from well, Tim. One Ellis. of the things, Philip, just to interject there, I think is is probably almost more kind of upsetting than the cost of living crisis, which is a crisis, right? It's a thing now. Is that the vast for the vast majority of the people who are really, really badly impacted by the cost of living crisis, they're always in a cost of living crisis, and they're always impacted by this stuff. And so it is just not it's not just this moment where we should be trying to find ways to support these people. It's you know, thinking about it longer term as well, right? How can we support them on a longer term basis? Okay, thanks, Tim. That's a good point. And, and while I'm talking to you, how, how can request to pay tick the right boxes in, in this space? Yeah, so, I, you know, I think my, my perspective on it um, is that for a lot of people, you know, why should you pay more for something? Um, just because you can't put something on a direct debit or can't put something on that biller's preferred method of controlling how you pay them um why should you be limited to having to pay monthly or manually when actually you're just you're paid in a different process to other people you're paid weekly perhaps or even daily or whatever it might be um, why should you be limited to that why can you not have a solution or a service that's more personalized to your needs and more under your control and i think that's where i see tools like request to pay being able to bring value is that they give the ability to benefit both sides, the biller can get visibility of what's actually happening across their payments. So they're given some of the security that comes from automated tools like direct debit, for example, where they know when it's gonna collect. Maybe, maybe it won't collect because there's no money, but they know when it's going to try. So they get visibility of that, but on the payer side, they're getting control and flexibility about how they do something. So maybe they get paid on a Friday. So they want to actually set their bills to come out on that Friday, but they need to be in control of that. They're busy. They don't have time to sit on the phone to their supplier, perhaps to do that. I know I wouldn't. Um, so, you know, giving them the ability to hold that in their own hands and to manage that themselves, to have the flexibility to change it when their situation changes, which it might do on a fairly ongoing basis. Um, I think that's where request to pay brings some really key attributes of giving control, giving flexibility, whilst giving visibility and insight to the biller so that they can both have um, both have what they need to enable them to manage things. And that, to my mind, should give those billers the ability to remove that poverty premium because they are getting that insight. Why should they charge more when they've got them on, on a tool that, that gives them what they were, they were trying to get? That would be a, my quick sort of answer on it. Thanks, Tim. I mean, you know, a case of the right product at the right time. Um, in some ways, which is really exciting. Mike, I, I know that AnswerPay is also delivering request to pay solutions. Uh, what can you add to the, the conversation? That, that Tim yeah, I, I think I'll just pick up on the point you just made. I mean, building on Tim's point, but picking up on your point, Philip, about um, right time, right place. I think the thing I would add to that right time, right place is in one place. As we think about the way we manage our money, typically it's digitally, typically foremost, it's, it's within app. Um, and what you know, it's good to be able to manage that money in one place and to be able to sort of congregate all our financial affairs into that one place and be able to manage our money is, is quite a, a helpful feature for a lot of people. So the one place aspect for me translates as request to pay being bank inclusive. So, you know, if we look to explain that and unpack that, if we look at the emergence of faster payments, uh, back in 2007 and the introduction of current account switching nearly a decade ago and the debits card schemes that we've got in the UK. All of those examples have been successful and have learned from each other because they have ubiquity and they're inclusive. 
they're accessible to people to use and i can i've got that ubiquity regardless of where my account sits and who i bank with and i think our focus at answer pay in the domain of request to pay is to think about how that ecosystem and how that solution is both ubiquitous and inclusive so it's something can people understand but it's something they can use regardless of who they bank with and who they buy goods and services from and that bank inclusive piece you know is a little bit like the uh, the, the home screens on your on your phone and um, you know i don't need another car parking app i don't need another streaming app to a most extent i don't need another banking app uh, but what i need within my banking app is a place where my payments congregate in one place and I can do something with it that I choose to do. So I can do things myself rather than being done unto by my bank or by the, the person I brought the good and the services for. And I think if you think about it from a the person providing the goods and services, you know, they've probably adopted direct, direct debits 20, 30, 40, some even 50 years ago in terms of Unilever, the first boat to ever use direct debit. You know, the, those billers, they need to be able to reach all their customers, whoever they bank with. They're not going to adopt solutions where it's, well, I can get 30% of my market or I have to work out who Philip banks with, who Carl banks with, old oh, Tim, I can't get to him because he banks with X. You know, the, 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 the billers need to be able to say, I can reach whoever I want. It needs to complement the other payment types they have, whether that's direct debits or cards or whatever they're using. It has to fit together well. And then from a consumer point of view, you know, it's that point about the ability for all my bills to come into one place, an account that I choose, not somebody else. And when it gets there, I've got the ability to manage that in line with the money that sits on my account and the periodicity, um, periodicity of when I'm actually paid. And that, you know, we used to talk about the gig economy. That's just that doesn't even go anywhere near describing often lumpy incomes that folk have. Um, in their week by week, month by month management of their money. So I think the ability to um, get that request to pay to travel directly from the biller into the payment screen of the banking app I choose is a really powerful proposition because it does a really important thing. What it does is it empowers consumers to choose who they pay, when they pay and how they pay. And for me, that's a central tenant of what we're trying to do at Answer Pay. And it's a central tenant of the opportunity of request to pay. Thanks, Mike. And I think that single view is, is really important, isn't it? I mean, this is a slightly trivial example, but you know, I've got six grandsons and frequently they're in our lounge looking at our telly and they're saying, can we watch Tractor Ted or can we watch Thomas the Tank Engine or can we watch PJ Masks or something else? And the challenge of going through Netflix, Prime, iPlayer, ITV Hub, trying to find the right program on the right channel drives them to frustration while they're waiting. Um, and, and I think, you know, if you that analogy, moving that into the banking account where it's much more fundamental to somebody and likely to be much more damaging is really important. So the single view for me is a really, really powerful tool. Carl, we've talked a couple of times about poverty premiums, um, but do you want to just, you know, delve a bit more into that and explain to us and to our listeners and, and viewers exactly what poverty premiums are and what their impact is. Yeah, I, I, I want to start as well by, um, by uh, coming back to something that Mike just said then. One thing that, that we've been told multiple times in, in focus groups, work that we've done with people who are exposed to poverty premiums is that I've got one example. We, we pay quarterly on our energy bills because of our income. We can't pay direct debit because we don't have the same thing every month. And I think that speaks to something that, that Mike has said there. Whether, whether we think there's any truth to um, the ability to pay with direct, direct debits, if you have a particular way you can pay, that's by the by. The fact is that the perception is there, that direct debits aren't working for people. And, and, using direct debits would penalize people as well and that's the thing that we've got to have a conversation about and we've got to open up for for consumers but if i take a step back and say what a little about what poverty premiums are uh, sometimes premiums are talked about as things that are good but premium in the uh, in the term poverty premium doesn't mean a good thing it means a penalty so if, if you're on a very low income and you're paying for consumer credit very unlikely to, to be able to receive the interest-free um, 
very, very good teaser rates, kinds of credit cards that the people who are better off are getting. Often you're paying very, very high interest. You're, you're going to some of the lenders that aren't the household names of the banks, but rather the household names in certain communities in certain areas. Um, if you're paying insurance, you're often paying for the area you live in. And that area might not be very nice and the insurer might want to put a premium on, to, on top of the, uh, the insurance payments you're paying. If you're paying for energy, you might be paying for a, with a prepayment meter rather than direct debits. And prepayment meters are among the most expensive way of, of, of paying for energy. And the most expensive way of paying for energy happens to be, ironically, what those who can't afford that extra payment tend to pay. pay prepayment meters are about six million in the market, all of which or most of which are um, used by low income households. So it's one of those cruel ironies. Poverty premium describes a cruel irony where if you've got very little, you pay more for that fact. Yeah, Thank, thanks, Carl. Tina, you, you look at this from the academic viewpoint rather than the, the sort of hands on piece. Any, anything you can add to that conversation? Well, no, just to agree with what Carl, Carl was saying there, that it really is about, it, I prefer to call it a, a poverty poverty penalty because actually it's penalizing those people who um, have the lowest means and actually forcing them to use payment methods or, or payment setups that actually lead to them paying more for the same goods and services that people on higher financial means have. Um, one of the things that we're trying to understand more of in the University of Edinburgh is quantifying these poverty premiums and trying to understand exactly how and where they're happening in it and in what way for different people and uh, to be able to identify how then we can move forward in, a, in addressing and alleviating some of those uh, issues for, for people uh, on lower financial means. Yeah. And, and are the from your research so far are the worst cases in utilities um, and insurance and those sort of, are there any other sectors that that we haven't touched on that, that are particularly um, prominent? So utilities and insurance and credit, I would say, are the are the biggest ones, and they're the ones that are. The, the most used you know you can't escape utilities everybody's got to access electricity and and possibly gas in some cases um, but it's also the areas where the proportion of expenditure that families on low incomes make you know it, that accounts for the largest proportion of their expenditure to a certain extent food um, there are also poverty premiums in food as well um, particularly where people can't access cheaper supermarkets, the larger supermarkets and are driven to um, convenience stores around the corner, you know, where the prices are a lot higher. Um, so it's, it's there's, a, there's a, all of these things have compounding effects as well. They do, it's, you know, the more you dig, the more you see things that, that you uh, you otherwise might. Yeah, yeah, but, it, but it's in those services where people can't avoid them you know you you've got to access electricity you've got to buy food um and most of these individuals as well are, are accessing some form of credit and um so either they're paying more for the credit or there are credit deserts in that they haven't got access to affordable means sure okay thank you tim how, how does our you know request to pay fit into this and how can it how can it help yeah, so we've talked about a few of these points already, right, of, of how it, the flexibility, the control, the single view um, that you're giving those users. I think um, when you take those and you look at them and you look at the way that that's helping a customer, there's a lot of different benefits, whether it is just their ability to um, pay efficiently to their needs, you know, to their financial needs when the money is coming in for them, to be able to flex that when they need to. So to go, well, actually, I haven't got the cash today, so I'll need to change that to tomorrow. The ability to message and communicate with your biller in a much more efficient manner than perhaps having to sit on the phone and, and call them, which people won't do necessarily because it's an uncomfortable conversation to perhaps say, hey, I'm struggling to pay my bill. So to change the medium around how you engage with that, I think is a really powerful tool as well. I think, you know, there's a, a number of different factors that come into this. And if you look at it from a um, from the biller perspective, these are your customers. You should be trying to find ways to make it better for your customers in all respects, not just for the service that you deliver, but for every aspect of it. And, you know, what we probably all see 
is that the front end's shiny. And as soon as you get to the back end, it's much more grimy, right? So, and you know what I mean by that. You get a lovely front end app that does certain things that, that meet your needs. But then when it comes to perhaps getting servicing, when it comes to perhaps trying to follow up on something or trying to ask a question or something, it becomes a lot harder. You know, where's the phone number on the website? I can't find it because obviously it's by far behind five layers of they don't want to have to talk to you. Yeah. Um, all of that sort of stuff where actually I've received my bill I've received it wherever I wanted to, whether that's my bank app or another app. And I can talk to you on this bill right now, right here. And that might be to say, hey, this is wrong. Or it might be to say, hey, I'm struggling. Or it might be to do anything else that's related to that. Or I can pay it. Or I can split it into you know, smaller payments so that I can manage it more effectively. What we're doing there is actually saying to these people, hey, why don't we give you the power to manage this in a way that suits you? Why don't we take away some of that stress that comes with being told what to do all the time around payments when really, you know, you don't have, a, you know, as we've said around insurance, as a great example of perhaps your area is not so nice, you're, you're have things applied to you based on the, the environment that you're in. That's just another negative factor that's being imposed on you because of the environment you're in as an example, right? So how can we take away some of those things? And I think if billers aren't recognizing that particularly now, but always as well, how you treat your customers and how you help your customers reflects across all aspects of your business. And I think that's really important. And this is a great tool to give you the ability to do that without some of the costs that might normally come with personalization, right? Because you're not saying I'm going to have to do a particular program for every single customer. You're saying I'm going to give the power to the customer to manage it how they need to, but I'm going to get the insight to see what they're doing so that I'm not just throwing away the reins, right? I'm still, in, I'm still, I still have control over the journey, but I'm letting them choose the directions they go. And I think, you know, that's a really powerful thing to do. And it's a really powerful way to treat your customers. And it, it will have a huge number of benefits beyond just helping people, right? Because your NPS scores will go up. You'll get faster payment or more likely to get payment. You know, people won't just not pay you. They'll actually communicate with you. All of these things will occur as you start to put the tools in place to do it. And obviously that has, in, that has positive impacts on your forecasting or it has positive impacts on, you know, your customer relations or it has positive impacts on your cash flow. Lots of different things. You know, I could go on. Right? So um, I think there's a lot of different areas that it can help in. Um, similarly to how direct debit was a really powerful tool. But, you know, there's just more things we could do now. It was a really powerful tool then, but now there's so many other opportunities to, to deliver value. We should be reflecting on and including those alongside tools like Direct Debit. Okay, thank you. Mike, anything to add to that? Yeah, I'd pick up on that final point Tim mentioned about direct debit and Carl also mentioned direct debits. You know, I'm not I've not been through some massive um, conversion route to Damascus in terms of my views on direct debit. I ran the direct debit scheme for, for 10 years. I built it to four and a half billion transactions. You know, direct debit works really, really well for many people, but not all. Direct debit works really, really well for some of our payment needs, but not all. And it's the, for those people that it doesn't work or they choose not to use it or for those payments um, that uh, don't work within direct debit, we've got to find good, efficient solutions for those people and those scenarios. And that's why I get excited about requests to pay, you know, and it's really, really easy for me to say, well, of course, direct, um, request to pay empowers the consumer. Of course, what I want to do is to provide the end user with the ability to choose who they pay, when they pay and how they pay. They're, they're really easy things to say. But, but let me just turn two examples of how I think that becomes a reality from request to pay. Request to pay turns a problematic direct debit, you know, not having enough money, not having enough money at the right time into something that the consumer can control. So instead of being done unto, for their phone bill, for their sky, for their um, utility bill, and having the money drawn out and a date which may or may not be good when the money may or may not be there this month, next month, whenever, you know, request to pay allows that transaction to happen in reverse as a mirror image by being asked for the money and I can control making that payment. So those times that direct debit doesn't work, then request to pay offers an opportunity to uh, to ensure that they, the, the person needing to pay somebody can do it in a way that works for them. The other example that I've just cut, we've just been involved quite recently working with somebody picks up Carl's comments around um, prepayment meters and the downsides of um, those particular issues is that often some of the attributes of the payment type is the folk have cash, 
because they want to use cash or they need to use cash. And they, they are disadvantaged because they're using an analog form of money buying a service. And I think request to pay, we've been working with somebody which has said, well, we'll take that analog cash, we'll convert it to digital, tie it to the request to payment, and that payment can flow through faster payments. So that the, the end users have the ability to operate in a medium, a cash medium that works for them, but they've not been disadvantaged because they've chosen the analog versus the digital store of value, but they've had access to the digital payment. And that for us was quite exciting. And, and then just to circle rounds on, um, you know, some of the challenges and the downsides around prepayment meters and tariff, you know, request to pay, you know, can start to address some of those downsides. For whatever reason, they, they, they've got, uh, they're in, unable to use a pull payment from their, their account, but we enable through request to pay them to be able to make those payments in a way works for them. Because it works for them, the person asking for money gets them within the criteria that they're looking for, and they've then paid. And if, if tools like request to pay can just get rid of a small proportion of the UK population who are forced into the prepayment meter, then you know I'll sleep a lot more soundly at night. Thanks for that, Tom. Very interesting. Carl, we, we, we've talked at Direct Debit about Direct Debit at some length now. Um, and I, I used to work for Vodafone where I was generating about 4 million Direct Debit bills a month. And, and, and the system worked great for, as Mike said, for you know, a, a large proportion of the population. But from your perspective, if you look fair by design, Direct Debit, to what extent is it workable or not? And what should we be looking to do? Again, I, I should echo Mike's point. Um, that direct debit pays it helps an awful lot of people myself included you know diet it's, it's not a uh it's not a and or i don't think in terms of um, understanding different payments methods and how they work for people they don't work for everyone and uh, and and for most everyone it has been considered the norm and um and i'm bringing back something that tim said as well we it is the norm for, for so many people, and that's as maybe, but uh, we can do so many more things now. So request to pay, in, in terms of the question, um, but if I, I, I guess the, the real issue is the lack of payment flexibility, a lack of, of flexibility in the system has been a problem for so long. That being said, there is flexibility there. If I have a problem, I know who to get on the phone to, I can, and I have the, the pest of power and the sharp elbow enough to, to get what I need done but um it, quite frankly it shouldn't rely on someone having the the confidence and, and being a bit of a pest down the phone or feeling like you're being a bit of a pest down the phone to to ask for flexibility from time to time because the system the payment system and the way in which we buy our essentials because it is so sophisticated today it should allow us the same level of flexibility across the piece that uh, you and I might benefit from. So for those consumers who um, who are paid, for example, on a particular time of the month, just after their bills come out, there's an obvious problem there that can be rectified quite quickly. Um, if there was more payment flexibility in the system and something like request to pay or other forms of payment flexibility were able to basically give someone the ability to pay when they wanted to on the grounds that there was just a little bit of a, a you know a, a difference between the pay date and, and pay coming out it seems common sense to me the system should allow for that flexibility and that would give a lot more people the kinds of financial resilience and and you know what others might call financial capability in the, in the market that that um that would be deserved of them from them. Okay. Thank you. Tina, have you got any data on, on direct debits and, and, and their efficiency or otherwise, or the, the likely damage that they can do where people haven't got capacity to use them? Um, well, from some of the analysis that, that colleagues and I have been doing, we've seen um, certainly in recent months um, an increase in returned direct debits or direct debits not being paid and I think this is clearly um, indicating to us that there's a sign that for some people at least regular direct debit payments coming out of the bank account at certain times are not really working for, for all individuals in terms of being able to balance the books and manage the payments um, and I think coming back to buy now pay later I think perhaps one of the reasons why people 
people are turning to that is because it does give them a little bit more flexibility in terms of spreading out the payments, but it's not optimal either because it's also um, structuring the payment in a particular way that that is also fixed over, you know, three or four payments that are also dictated by a, a supplier rather than the consumer. So I think coming back to this idea of flexibility and empowerment, I think these are the two things that I would stress really heavily that Request to Pay has to offer consumers in terms terms of giving them uh, that greater flexibility in terms of how they manage their payments. Individuals themselves know best, you know, how much money they're going to have in their bank account when that's coming in. And then having that ability to be able to see all of those payments through that single view, I think is really empowering. When you compare that with what a lot of people are using now, if they've got four or five buy now, pay later payments, potentially with four or five different organizations, you know, all being paid at different times. It's no wonder that some people are running into financial difficulties by simply not having that oversight. And I think having that single view through something like request to pay provides that greater oversight. You've also got the opportunity to have the conversation with the um, supplier as well, um, if it's not possible to, to pay at a certain date. Um, but that increased flexibility over when to pay, I think um, is really empowering for consumers. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that's true. Um, and it's interesting to hear it, that, that coming from, um, from you. But before we leave Buy Now, pay, pay Later, what do you see as the future of that, where it evolves to next? Do you think regulation is going to come? Um, it's on the cards, although it's taking time. And, and that, that will help to a certain extent. But I think it still doesn't get rid of some of the problems that I mentioned before with you know multiple providers and multiple um, payment uh, schedules that individuals might have so I you know I think there still is that uh, the benefit I think that request to pay offers in terms of giving that single view over helping consumers see what what bills they have to pay when they're going to be paid and giving consumers that flexibility and control over how they manage those payments and how and how they manage their money and and as Carl said you know it feeds into building financial resilience for people rather than someone else dictating when payments need to be made which may not be at, at the exact optimum time um, particularly for individuals that don't have regular salaries on a month-to-month -month basis that can be predicted. Okay thank you. Um, I'm going to turn to Tim now and then Mike um, and I want to you know imagine if I've just bought something on Amazon and I, and I click BNPL, and I'm doing it over three months. And then I've bought some clothes from Next and I'm doing the same thing. And then I've gone to somewhere else and I've ended up with four or five um, different BNPL schemes um, where I'm buying a number of things over three or four months or whatever it might be, um, as, as Tina was describing. Can you just talk us through, Tim, you know, how that would work in you know, a blue chain solution, request to pay solution? What, what would I see as the as the consumer who's currently got four or five direct debits being stacked up or debits being stacked up over the coming weeks and months? Yeah, and I think, you know, just looking at it from a pure request to pay perspective, as well as a blue chain perspective, but looking at it from a pure request to pay perspective and that single view is the ability to choose how you pay for something, you know, agnostically, because it's not about then your bank or your provider then dictating the payment methods you get to choose, right? Because that obviously then just defeats the purpose again. The point of it is I've chosen to use this bank account, that credit card, this buy now, pay later solution, whatever might be the things that make up my financial kind of tools. Um, and now rather than having four or five different places to go to collate that data so that I can get that financial view of what's actually happening, I can see it from one place. So I can choose to receive my bills into that place. And then I can choose to pay whichever tool meets my needs. You know, when I've got cash in the bank, I'll use cash. Maybe I haven't, or maybe it's not the right sort of purchase for cash. I'll use a credit card. Hey, maybe it's a larger purchase and I do want to split it across, you know, a certain set of, of time period. I'll use my buy now, pay later capability. And, you know, th there could be several of each of those solutions in there. But the point being that you've then got a singular view 
of what's actually happening across those financials rather than all those different places. You know, I liken this to some of the work, work I've done in the, the business space where businesses will have lots of different places to log into, same as consumers, right? And none of us like having all those different logins to remember. None of us like having to go, you know, I was doing it myself this morning, which I probably shouldn't admit to, to try and sort something out on a credit card. And it's just like, oh, which login's this? And what was the username I used for that? And all of that, and you know, that goes in spades, right? And, and like we all have all these different things, not just for payments. So if I've got one place where I know that's where I can see what I'm doing financially, I think that's tremendously powerful. Um, it'd be powerful for me, um, it would be powerful for anybody who wants to keep a better eye on their finances without having to have the stress of where is it and oh I missed that one um, all of that kind of stuff so I think that's the power in it for me and that's that single view is is how it would work and you know it, it makes it very seamless I think that's answered the question I hope so yeah I think it has um, Mike what's yeah. your let me just pick up on something, Tina, emerging of Tina and Tim's comments. I think, you know, from a BNPL point of view, I don't want to focus too much on it other than to say, I hope regulation comes soon. You know, it's a bit of a wild west. We need to make sure that consumers are appropriately protected and we don't fall into issues of the past. That said, I would say BNPL can work and can work well. And those signs of lumpy purchases, just dealing with something that's come from left of field in, in a way that doesn't pe meet people resort to, you know, le less ethical or more expensive forms of finance. So uh, when I do get worried is I see supermarkets or fast food outlets offering their goods and services on BNPL. So I think that there's a that, yeah, BNPL isn't intrinsically bad. It's what it's offered for and how it's used. Um, Request to pay BNPL, you know, they 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 are very different, but quite similar in some ways. Request to pay offers that ability for a delayed, a staggered payment. And in the case of request to pay without resorting to credit, you know, that's sort of OK. It allows people to, to manage their payment profile. But then I pick up on the point that was made. Well, what if I go here for that and there for that? And I've got three or four things. You know, aggregation, aggregating them into my bank account or into the one place I talked about earlier on um, is really, really powerful. Um, but for me, if my bank were able to provide me that single place of aggregation where I could see my financial picture and overlaid, you know, request to pay payments that were requests that were coming in, overlaid maybe even BNPL and started to suggest through machine learning and AI about with well, a profile against a credit ladder against previous income and start to help me order my payments in a way that would make sense that not only can I control it in that one place and I can use a credit ladder and um, make those decisions, but what if the bank intelligent in the background tried to help me in that process? That's when I think we'll see real changes in the way that we empower people to manage their money well. And if people are managing their money well, they will be making their payments differently and therefore the ability to manage those. You know, if you look for businesses, you know, Tim talked about, you know, looking at some data this morning. If you look from a business point of view, yeah, the accounting packages out there do this really well for small businesses. You know, do some profiling, some forecasting and all the rest of it. Look, oh, imagine if we could do that in the consumer space and then put the payment choices in there and payments went out, went out at a cadence that met my needs and met, met my requirements and my ability to pay and my profile of paying rather than when somebody thinks they can go and dip in and take the money from my account. That's a really good point. And I think one of the challenges is that, that you know, fundamentally, technology is seen as a way to improve and make processes more efficient, rather than from the point of view you're coming at, which is actually how you can help people with it and use it more effectively. Carl, Carl you've been listening. Just to, just to carry on on Mike's thought, sorry, Philip, to interrupt. And I think, you know, that that machine learning type comment, that how can I help you? There are already tools out there that do some of that stuff, not necessarily the machine learning bit, but they help you kind of categorize. You know, I use an open banking based tool to manage my finances and I picked it up. I started using it because I was in a bit where I was like, OK, I need to probably be a bit tighter on some of my spending. Um, and I realized I was spending a lot of money on takeaway coffees, right, which just disappeared into the ether because it was just a just a few pounds, yeah. just a few pounds. But across a month, every day of the week. That suddenly, you know, three quid times 30, you kind of get where I'm going. That was not money I needed to be spending, but I didn't have real sight of it because it was just on my credit card statement or just on my bank statement. And I think that's where, you know, you could take that much broader than just coffees and look at your whole picture and then take real intelligence and add to it rather than Tim just going, oh, I should, probably shouldn't spend that much money on coffee, Tim. Um, you know, there's amazing ways you can then use those technologies linked to all of the different things we're talking about here to, to really add value to a consumer. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's tremendously powerful. And, and, you know, you fuse that information 
into making payments and choosing how you pay. You know, you fuse. It's all right knowing the information, isn't it? But what can I do about it? Well, I can go to Cafe, Cafe Zero at Nero less times, go to Starbucks less times, or or and. Actually, I could make this payment differently and benefit from this tariff or I could make this more efficiently uh, or at a better time. And I don't take an overdraft fee from my bank. So so actually fusing information with payment choice together makes things really powerful. And as consumers, we've probably been a bit lacking in that space compared to corporates. OK, thanks, Carl. Um, you've been listening patiently to this discussion around, you know, request to pay and, and single view and all of that stuff. What, what's your view in this part of the world, given your client base and the people that you're trying to help? I think, well, given that um, where Fair by Design looks at, we're, 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 we're talking to low income households and a lot, they're looking for a ray of, of light in the, in the payments world, because what they want to see is the same level of flexibility that, that, and flexibility, I think, is probably a good proxy for trust as well. And you know, low-income households want to feel trusted in the ways in which they're paying. Often, the difficulties uh, come through not having that flexibility in built in the system. It's not that people are bad with money necessarily, um, or have bad habits. I have plenty, but I'm not deemed a, a you know a bad consumer for that reason. But um, it's it's more to do with the fact that the system hasn't made it very easy for for, for those uh, for those households and those customers, and that the system should make it uh, much easier. Um, I like what uh, Mike was saying earlier about the uh, you know the aggregator having that all in one place. If you're slightly better off, you have a financial advisor who can do that for you. Um, the payment system is is sophisticated enough today that I think it can start to do that that level of aggregation and understanding where payments are coming from. Open banking is an opportunity in this as well, and that would give low income households a, a bit more opportunity to see their outlay of costs and, and payments, income and outgoings, and that just makes it a lot easier to be in the sorts of situation. I mean, it doesn't clear up the situation. The situation is is, is hard that requires another solution that requires government to step in. But in terms of knowing our incomes, outgoings, adding to that financial resilience piece, there's a, a lot of opportunities for, for the payment system and also the suppliers and risk potentials because the kit is there, the sophistication is there and, and some of the ability for payment flexibility and request to pay is there. What we've now got to see is those utilities companies come in and Trust the trust that system, trust that innovation, and trust that sophistication in payments, and that would make uh, well, that would make me happy. I think it may be, it'd make you happy as well. Thank you, Tina. I mean, one of the issues clearly here, as with all things, is getting people to be aware of what there is and what's coming, and so on. Do you, do you, from your research, what's your view around awareness of what is available already and what's coming downstream? Do you mean from a consumer's point of view? Yeah. 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 I, th I think I think it is a tricky one for consumers because I think consumers are very much driven by um, what it is they need to acquire in terms of a good or service and then looking really at what that provider offers in terms of a payment solution, you know, whether that is credit, whether that's buy now, pay later, whether that is some kind of prepayment option or whatever. So I think, I think consumers are very much driven by the point of sale payment options rather than thinking, okay, what might be an optimal payment solution and how can I apply that to a particular good or service that, that I'm um, wanting to, to acquire. So I do think in terms of, of awareness, it, it, it is going to come very much through the suppliers, which is probably brings us back to the, the point that Carl was making there about how do we get the suppliers on board with this so that then 
the suppliers are making those payment options available to consumers, because um, as, as has already been highlighted, you know, that there's, a, there's an array of choice from buy now, pay later, direct debit, um, cash payments or whatever, and, and all of these are totally acceptable in a variety of different um, scenarios for different people, but don't necessarily all work for everybody all of the time. And so it's how, how do we get the suppliers on board to offer that choice to consumers? Okay, thank you. Um, Mike, open banking is, is you know, growing exponentially. We're told there are 6 million customers now using it. Isn't that of itself the solution for regular payments? Depends what you mean by open banking. I mean, you know, huge success in the United Kingdom around open banking, you know, 6 million customers, you know, we're, we're top of the world in terms of the adoption um, and, and, and sort of uh, the interest in open banking. But I think we've yet to even start to exploit the benefits of open banking. We've done a lot around sharing information and aggregating information. We started to do some sort of payments initiated by open banking within some sweeping VRPs variable reoccurring payments. So I think we're at the beginning of a very, very wide subject that will very soon move from open banking to open finance to probably open everything. And, you know, there are some real hot topics in the open banking space presently around addressing APP fraud or for us push payment fraud, you know, how you roll out a true ubiquity of open banking initiated payments and how you move sweeping variable reoccurring payments to more commercial um, reoccurring payments. And those are the hot topics in, in open banking presently. And actually, what request to pay can do for people and their bills um, are, are part of that. And it sits, a request to pay sits inside of that debate, not in the periphery. So I think it's request to pay as part of that mix of how open banking can move to the next stage and really transform uh, payments. So, yeah, great number of customers uh, using open banking. We should absolutely applaud that. But the question and the challenge is, what is request to pay and other payments type uh, within open banking and how do they coexist and work together? If you know this is about request to payment, this sort of uh, this webinar today, and I think my message from request to payment is request to pay is, is ready for that debate. You know, it's primed and ready for action. It has the ability to empower uh, consumers to make payments in a much better way, whether it's one off or regular. Um, we need we need request to pay to be part of that wider debate about utilizing that very, very loose term, open banking, so changing our payment habits. Okay, thank you. Tim, anything to add to that? Uh, not really. I, I think I'd echo some of what Mike said there. You know, th there's a huge number of different tools out there and we're scratching the surface on some of them um, and combining them is the future. Uh, I often hear, why do we need this? Or why do we need that? Or you don't need that, or you don't need this it's never going to be that case, right? There's always going to be a case of, well, I want to use this so solution because it meets my needs, whatever those needs might be. And someone else is going to use want to use something else. So um, there's not going to be a one size fits all, which is absolutely, I think what Mike is saying. Um, but I've certainly heard it from some of the open banking providers who like to think that they're the second coming and um, there is no other route. And we all know that's not the case, right? It's not all going to be request to pay either. So um, I just think there's going to be an, an opportunity to amalgamate those technologies to create something even better than we're probably talking about today right and um that's the exciting part for payments at the moment i think thank you mike the europe the european commission has just mandated instant payments how do you see this impacting payment services in the uk and continental europe um well i think from a continental europe point of view or a eurozone or however you want to regard that that groupings of economies and countries um i think the mandating of instant payments is is their faster payment moment you know we had faster payments here in the uk in 2007 it changed the face of how we manage our money and make payments um and therefore from a european i'll give it the wider term uh, point of view, uh, it will transform the way that payments are made both in country and across region. Um, it will also create that environment where uh, overlay services like request to pay and others that we might have talked about today become a viable proposition in that in that zone. Um, so I think, you know, in some respects, it's a shame that European Commission had to mandate it. You know, we've seen the benefit in UK and other geographies of faster payments. It would have been much better if there'd been that sort of natural adoption and rollout 
and traction across across that region. Uh, it's come from sort of the uh, the commission. So, you know, the reality is it will come through there. Uh, but I think that some of the transformation we've seen in this country uh, we'll see across that region. And for overlay services, for open banking services, whatever we want to call them, um, it's great news. Okay, thank you. Carl, if I was to ask you what the top three things, um, the top three most important factors that um, a payment provider or a payment handler should uh, deliver to deliver a good customer experience, what would they be? Flexibility is my number one. Uh, number two, simplicity, um, because if you have an overly complicated payment structure or, or, or any sort of structure, it's off-putting and people aren't going to be reaping the benefits. Um, and number three, it should be, um, I would say, fair and even innovative. So I'm, I'm, I'm taking a mick a bit by having more than three, but <laughs> fair and innovative. And what I mean is that it should be inclusive as well. It, it can be innovative, it can be sophisticated, but it needs to be inclusive and, and mindful of the ways in which people work rather than to create something that you hope everyone fits into. Yeah. It, it needs to be inclusive. And we've got inclusive design now. Inclusive design exists and um, it's, it's easy to use as far as systems uh, provision is, con is concerned to do this. I think Carl's spot on there. I mean, you know, I, I would I would describe that as you know everybody are putting out their solutions. They need to be inclusive. They need to be accessible, and they need to be equitable. And if we start to think about those watchwords, we will transform payments and financial management for, for everyone in society, whoever they are. Good points. Thank you, Tim. How does someone get on board with your request to pay? Well, so you know, there's a number of providers in the market. You've got two on the the line here with Blue Chain and Answer Pay. Um, there's lots of different routes to that, but ultimately, you know, check out our websites for a start point or, or LinkedIn with us. Um, the actual ability to deliver this sort of solution is not hard. It's not a difficult lift. It's not lots of, of technical work. Um, it's pretty simple, right? And it's you know, driven by the providers who, who do it themselves. So um, the adoption piece obviously is the next step to that process, but the actual in, uh, implementation isn't too difficult. So, you know, look us up. We'd love to talk to you. Okay, thank you. Mike. Uh, almost the same answer as Tim. Yeah, check the folk out there. They're in the request to pay space. We're at answerpay.uk. Um, talk about our approach and request to pay. Reach out on LinkedIn. And as you said at the top of this uh, call, um, you know, check out and subscribe to my newsletter at payments-unpacked.com. Thank you very much. Before we finish, I'm, I'm going to ask each of our panelists to share one th key thing they'd like people to take away from this discussion. I've really enjoyed it. It's been really fascinating and insightful. Um, and I want to say a huge thanks to Tina, Carl, Mike, and Tim for giving us their time, their expertise, and their insights today. There's no doubt that the, the, the world of payments is, is evolving, is going to change. Um, and the people on this call are involved in that and are leading the, the thinking around it. And I hope, hope we'll deliver something that is really fit for purpose and not only fit for purpose, but also fit for purpose flexibly so that everyone is included and everyone has access to the solutions that are there. But now for those key takeaways, please. Tina from Edinburgh University. Yeah, so I guess my key takeaway is really asking people and particularly providers and suppliers who might be listening is to think about how can how can you do better to support the customers and consumers that are that are using your business your bill payers um, what could you do to improve the customer experience for them by giving them greater choice and greater flexibility and also being more compassionate I think to um, to the, the the kind of situations that that people are facing and and to what extent do the payment methods that you currently use really offer that for the variety of consumers that you have and particularly vulnerable consumers and and I guess the answer would be if they had a hard look that perhaps they don't they don't meet everyone's needs and to what extent could you think about um, request to pay filling that gap uh, in your payment solutions great ask thank you Mike from answer pay I think mine is uh, just as a, a dog is not for Christmas, my piece of advice is not just for the current economic climate, but for the years ahead. 
you know, if you're a provider of services and um, for goods and services, think about how you empower your customers to choose who they pay, how they pay, and when they pay. Thank you. Carl from Fair by Design. Mine is look at the value of flexibility. Um, lots of providers of lots of different things value uh, the different ways in which we like to pay. Um, direct debits being one, cash payments being another. There are multiple other ones, but the value of flexibility is definitely something that people want. That's proven in you know companies like like the ones on this call being in existence. But also we've heard lots about payment flexibility in some of the focus groups that we've done. The value of flexibility. Have a look at it. Try and do something about it. <laughs> Thanks, Carl. And, and last but by no means least, Tim from Blue Chain. Yeah, I think um, probably echoing, I, I struggle not to repeat what others have said, right? So just to echo it, I think one of the things that I see really powerful about request to pay is customer experience. And, and that cuts across things that everybody said. Um, Customer experience isn't just for the financial crisis or the cost of living crisis or, or the current moment. Customer experience is what you should be running your business on because you don't have a business if you don't have customers. And customer experience cuts across everything you do. But often the most frequent touch point you'll have with your customer is when they pay you. Um, it's certainly one of the most important ones for you because that's when you get paid. So anything you can do to improve that experience for your customer across everything from consumers to businesses, utilities to one-off purchases should be something you're focused on very hotly, I would have thought. Um, it's certainly the customers that I talk to, you know, they're looking for how they can improve their customer experience. And this is a way, and it's got a lot of other factors to it. But So that's my thing, customer experience. Thank you so much. And thank you all four of you. That's all from us for now. So thank you for watching. I hope you found this session useful and as insightful as I have. Thanks for your time. Thanks very much, Philip.